and says, hey, why are you studying communication? <laughs> yeah, uh, or, you know, why would anybody study communication? And the related question, uh, why should we have a communication department in a university, as a matter of fact? Well, uh, what I'm hoping that they might say is this. Yeah, it's required for establishing and maintaining effective personal relationships. It's absolutely necessary for professional success, and it's essential for maintaining an effective democracy. So if you, if you run into one of my students in the brickyard, ask them. <laughs> and I'm hoping that's what they will say. Okay. Now, what I want to talk to you about tonight has to do with that third point about maintaining an effective democracy. For we do live in a democracy. This is not an authoritarian country. In authoritarian countries, the press is under the thumb of the, gov of the government. Okay, maybe maybe privately owned press, but it's under the thumb of the government. We don't live in a communist society where the press is part of the government, as a matter of fact. No, we have what we think of as a free press, a press that is free to tell us what is going on in the government, a press that can be a critic of government actions, as a matter of fact. You may have heard of the, the term the press as the fourth estate. I, I don't, uh, I, we're not going to go back through history here and explain the origin of that term. Suffice to say, in our country today, we can think of our government as having three estates and a, now a fourth estate, and the three estates of power of our government would be the executive, the judicial, and the legislative branches of government. Those are the three estates. The fourth estate is the press. In a democracy, the press keeps watch on the government for us. So the press has a lot of power, doesn't it? Not everybody likes that particularly. As a matter of fact, a, something we hear a lot today is don't believe the press. We hear it from time to time. Don't, don't believe them. Some political leaders don't like the press. They don't trust the press. Right? And so they want the press to go away, as if, you know, there's really nothing to see here, okay? Please keep walking right on by, okay? And so uh, this is, a, this is a, a somewhat of a problem, I think, in our society. And I want to start back in England a bit and talk about the press and the government and the relation between the press and the government in England, what we found out. But through our studies, and our students learn this in our classes, is that in England, boy, this was an authoritarian society. You had, if you had a printing press, you had to have a license to operate it from the, from the king. You had to have a license. And if you didn't have a license, you were out of business. If you wrote and print thing, printed things that the king didn't like, then you really were out of business because you could be hauled into court. And they held court in the Star Chamber. The Star Chamber, this is a room, these were rooms in those English manor houses, and on the ceiling they had it painted with stars, it looked like the sky. And they would have courts for certain crimes. And if you printed something the king didn't like, you would be hauled in uh, and accused of sedition, criticizing the government. And they would destroy your printing press, send you to prison for a while, probably wouldn't kill you, but they could make life awfully unhappy for you if, because the king didn't like, didn't trust the press. Okay? Uh, now, um, I am going to talk tonight about a fellow named John Wilkes for a bit. John Wilkes uh, lived those years, as you can see, and yeah, even though, as far as I know, he never set foot in North America. He's got a county in North Carolina named for him, Wilkes County, a town, Wilkesboro, and another town, North Wilkesboro, Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania, named for him, and there is a Wilkes County, Georgia, named for this dude. Let me tell you about John Wilkes, and we'll go quickly here through this. Uh, first of all, he was in Great Britain, of course, and he was elected to be a member of parliament in 1757. And uh, about five years later, he started the newspaper, the North Britain, 
And unfortunately, he, uh, 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 he attacked the king. He attacked the king. You're not supposed to do that. Remember, that seditious libel. And doggone, what happened was uh, he got in trouble. He got arrested, and he was about to be thrown in prison. However, he was a member of parliament. They had a protection. You know, they had a privilege that you couldn't put him in prison for certain crimes, and so he didn't have to go to prison, uh, and he was released very quickly if he was put in prison. Uh, he continued to attack the king. Uh, he was shot in the stomach by someone who was a supporter of the king. Um, his um, uh, protection against uh, seditious libel because he was a member of parliament was revoked. And so his friends got him out of town, took him to Paris, he lived there for four years. Upon return to England, he was arrested again. He was in prison. There were riots because he was in prison. He was very popular. And seven people were killed by the troops in the riots. He was re-elected three times while he was in prison. Three times. But he, remember, the, the House of Commons wouldn't let him serve. He was released from prison in 1770. He wanted to have the proceedings of the House of Commons printed. And uh, seems like a great idea, the debates. But the king didn't want this to happen. His printers were arrested. Um, but there was a huge crowd that came out in support of him. And so the House of Commons eventually was persuaded to let this happen. He was elected the mayor of London. He was uh, allowed eventually to take his seat in the House of Commons. And in 1776, he argued against his country's policy against the colonies. In other words, he argued for our independence. That was John Wilkes. Look at the problems he had trying to express himself. Not a free society. Under the thumb of the king, as a matter of fact. We think of John Wilkes as a hero today, right? Why else would Wilkes County be Wilkes County if someone didn't hold him in very high regard in his fighting for the freedom of speech? Well, some lives for Great Britain. Let's move over to the United States and let's come up to uh, the first newspaper in the colonies was uh, a newspaper in Boston called the uh, uh, Public Occurrences, both, former, uh, both foreign and domestic. It was Benjamin Harris in Boston. It was in 1690. And uh, uh, you guessed it. Guess what happened? Now, we're not in England anymore. We're in the colonies. Same-o, same-o, right? I mean, it's, it's British territory, really. And Benjamin Harris attacked, did some, said, wrote some things in his newspaper that the royal governor of Massachusetts did not like. Okay? And so, consequently, for this wonderful newspaper, the first newspaper on our land, the first issue was its last. It was put to sleep, as a matter of fact. Here it is, the public occurrences. What he had done was he, uh, he criticized a group of Native Americans, uh, Indians, Native Americans, who uh, were uh, allied with the British. And the British uh, royal governor of uh, Massachusetts did not like that at all. Okay? And so what he made had a proclamation that strictly forbidding anyone to publish anything without permission of the royal governor of Massachusetts. And, with, and uh, it was necessary after this time to clearly have a license or you couldn't be in the business at all. And so we didn't have a newspaper, by the way, in the colonies for 14 years. It was 14 years before another newspaper started publishing. And that newspaper, the second newspaper, was published by the postmaster, was, who was appointed by the royal governor. So it was friendly to the king. Uh, I love uh, this particular book. And by the way, I understand that I'm violating a tremendous, uh, very important rule of PowerPoint. That is, don't put too many words on the screen. <laughs> I, I know that, but I want you to see this book. This is from Eric Burns, Infamous Scribbler. It's a wonderful book about this subject. A wonderful book. And he is really telling you what people, what the, what the political powers thought about the press. It, it was new. It, it was scary. 
It was scary for the politicians. It could upset existing power structures, leading people to question them. At best, newspapers would require constant vigilance. Okay, at worst, they could turn on authorities, my goodness, they could state their own opinions uh, and make their own demands. They would become an adversary of government, as a matter of fact. Yeah, scary business. I love this quote from Lord Berkeley, and I want you to read it, okay? And I'm simply <laughs> going to read it, okay? I thank God that we have no free schools for printing, and I hope we shall not have these for these hundred years. For learning has brought about disobedience and heresy and sex, that's S-E-C-T-S, <laughs> into the world, and printing has devolved them as libels against the government. God, keep us from both, said Governor Burke. Well, so you get the point here, okay? Uh, Thomas Jeff now Thomas Jefferson, uh, most people know this quote uh, from Thomas Jefferson. He, he said this, he said, yeah, you know, this is a, he was thinking probably of the fourth estate role of the press, when he said we're enough to be decided whether we should have a government without newspapers or a newspaper without government, I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. Very nice thing to prefer the latter. Very nice things to say about newspapers. But do you know that Thomas Jefferson, years later, was upset? Yeah, he said some other things about newspapers. He said, a man who reads nothing is better educated than a man who reads newspapers. And he also said that the advertisement is the most truthful part of the newspaper. So all these politicians have problems with the press, as a matter of fact. The first president, well, yeah, yeah. This is where, by the way, um, um, Eric Burns gets his title for his book, Infamous Scribblers. Uh, it came from George Washington, who the Republican press just, I mean, they were really on uh, Washington's case. Uh, Thomas Paine said he was praying for the death of Washington. I mean. Uh, it was it was noisy, as a matter of fact. The Federalists, you know, there were two political parties, the Federalists and the Republicans, or the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, and George Washington and John Adams were the Federalists. Jefferson uh, was the uh, was an example of a Republican. But the Federalists thought that the Republicans uh, were forces of ignorance and subversion. And we would all go to Hades in a handbasket <laughs> if Thomas Jefferson got elected president. Where have we heard something like that? <laughs> yeah. A frequent theme of the Republican press, of course, is that George Washington wanted to be the king. He was going to be King George. Well, as you can see, a lot was going on. A lot of, uh, lot of, uh, lot of uh, disagreements. People didn't really get along at all. And it was much reflected in the press. But guess what? We passed the Constitution. We made a constant, got a Constitution. How about that? 1790 was ratified by all the states by then. And so we had this wonderful Constitution of the United States of America. How about this perfect document? Well, they must have not thought it was too perfect because the next year, what happened? Yeah, they modified it. And it changed to 10 times. There are 10 amendments. We call them the Bill of Rights. The next year. And one of them had to do with this freedom of speech. They must have been thinking about this. Look what it says. It says, Congress shall make no law. That first clause, respecting the establishment of religion, and then you see the freedom of the press and so forth, and the freedom of religion and all that. Congress shall make no law. Boy, that is reassuring, isn't it? Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it sure is. Oh, until seven years later, when guess what Congress did? They made a law. Okay, and the law was the Sedition Act of 1798, uh, made it a crime to publish false, scandalous, and malicious writing, or what the Federalists, this is a Federalist law, what the Federalists thought uh, would uh, uh, were malicious and scandalous. Okay. Uh, now it was uh, expired, and it had an expiration date attached to it, and it expired. It would have anyway because Thomas Jefferson got elected president. He wouldn't have anything to do with this. Okay, so it's on the surface, isn't it, unconstitutional? Correct? 
Sure, it's unconstitutional, but of course by then, by in this time period, 1798, 1799, the Supreme Court of the United States had not undertaken to uh, the notion of judicial review. They weren't looking at laws to see whether they might be constitutional or not. Didn't happen until 1803 with Marbury versus Madison. So it was before this the Supreme Court review for constitutionality. But Jefferson argued loudly for a long time that this was unconstitutional. They passed a law. By the way. Uh, we have uh, 25 people were arrested under this law, yes, and 15 were indicted, 11 went to trial, 10 were found guilty. What? What about the other one? Well, one was acquitted, which is truly amazing because most of the, almost all of the jurors and the judges were Federalists. Uh, and so we actually passed a law when it says Congress shall make no law, and uh, you wonder whether or not something like this can happen today. Could something like this happen today? Well, you know what? It did happen again. It happened in World War I. We had a nasty sedition law during World War I, as a matter of fact. Could it happen today? Okay. Well, what can we do about this? What do we, how do we want to think about this? Well, I think that uh, what, uh, what we have to consider is that this has something to do with the truth. It's about the truth. And I think that uh, the truth, many of us may consider it to be objective. We also know that the truth can also be subjective. There may be many truths, as a matter of fact. But I believe that one core part of an effective democracy, democracy has to be the search for truth as a matter of fact. And tonight, I want to uh, end my uh, period of time with you by uh, looking back at someone who wrote about this, wrote about what we've been talking about tonight, and what that person had to say about it. That person, a timely thing here, folks, from 1644. This is the Areopagitica, John Milton. Uh, John Milton wrote this. It's a speech. My understanding is this speech was never delivered. It was intended to be delivered to Parliament, but he didn't deliver. He wrote about the John Milton. He wrote about the truth. And I would like to take a moment just to show you what he said. There's one of the quotes in the area to get it go. Look what it says. And though all the winds of doctrine were let loose to play on the earth, so truth, with a capital T, be in the field. We do injuriously by licensing and prohibiting misdoubt her strength. Let her in falsehood grapple whoever knew truth put to the worst at a free and open encounter. 